Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and our interviewer Kay Yoland speaks with Chief Curator Michael Opping about the exhibition Frank Stella, a Retrospective. Now for Art This Week. Well, thank you so much for being here today with us. Uh, my pleasure. I thought we could start off with you just telling us about the scope of the exhibition. Well, it's a 60-year it's a retrospective, which in itself is really unusual. I've only seen, in, to my memory, two 60-year retrospectives, one by Willem de Kooning mm -hmm. and one, this one by Frank Stella. It's unusual to be able to see that much of a career in one place. Having said that, it's really difficult to try to condense that length of a career down into a presentation that shows all the twists and turns. Um, but it begins in 1958, uh, right after Frank graduated from Princeton and moved to uh, New York in the Soho area. And it goes up to pretty much the present, 2012, 2014. Did it take much persuading um, to get Stella interested in a retrospective at this point in his career? Yeah, it did. Um, actually, he still hasn't agreed to it. <laughs> he doesn't know it's at happening, the, he, even though he knows he's it's walking happening, around. <laughs> but he hasn't said no. At the, at the dinner uh, during the exhibition, um, I told the story that I went to Frank and said, you know, it has been three decades since you have had a retrospective, and wouldn't it be great to do one that was on the East Coast and in Texas and then on the West Coast? And he said, nah, I don't think so. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, and I took that, of course, to mean, yes, Michael, you should go right ahead and do that retrospective. And I did. And he hasn't said no. So at the dinner, I said, the fact that you're here tonight, Frank, is encouraging to me. <laughs> it's actually happened. <laughs> it's happened. Uh, you still haven't agreed to it, but that's fine. How did you meet up with him? What were the kind of weeks or years like trying to work out what stays in, what goes? I've never worked on an exhibition this long. This took nearly six years to do. And the first time I visited Frank's studio in Newburgh, New York, this is upstate of Manhattan, uh, about an hour and a half out from Manhattan, it is in a gigantic warehouse, literally, one square acre of enclosed space. That's huge. And it's full of stuff, of Frank's stuff, of Frank's sculpture, to the extent that there, you know, it kind of twists together. And when I first went, I couldn't tell where one work began and the other work started. And I thought, wow, this is going to take a long time. The early career, I knew by heart. That wasn't a problem. It's really after about 1985 that I was concerned that I needed to really uh, do a lot more research. It took a lot of time. I mean, it took a lot of honing. I went through a lot of checklists. I basically made the checklist around this building because I know this building very well. But it, it took a long time. And, you know, some arguments with Frank, well, probably a lot of arguments with Frank. But, you know, at the end of the day, Frank has survived and been an important artist because he is able to self-edit and be self-critical. And I'd show him some things and he'd say, you know, Michael, not my best effort. And that always made me feel better that we were, you know, that we're on the same page here. The idea is to get the highlights. We can't show the whole thing. Frank, over his 60-year career, by my count, and no one really knows, including Frank, he's done about 44 different series of works. There's at least 20 works in each series with variations within those works. So we're talking thousand works here. Uh, and we boiled it down to, you know, including drawings, maybe 110. And to be that prolific, I'm imagining he has to work with quite a lot of people. What does his uh, setup look like? You've, you've mentioned the size of the mm -hmm. warehouse. Who is he working with? How many, what different types of people does he need to employ? He has, um, let's see, one, two, three, at least four pretty full-time assistants. You know, when he was in a small studio in New York in 1958, when he was 22 years old, 
You know, he'd make a painting, he'd pick the painting up and put it on another wall and, and then begin working on another one. And Frank was a very physical guy, very sports-oriented guy. Um, now he's, he turns 80 next week, so he's not picking a lot of stuff up. But what he does do is he has these huge sculptures and he has an overhead crane that's on a, it's on a track. So things can be picked up and moved through the studio on this track. And he has these four guys that help him. And he also now employs a computer, a CAD program, to help him design different forms that he then manufactures and then puts together either using his own hands or, or having his assistants put them together. So that would be the more architectural pieces like K81 or K.459? Correct. Because there's definitely an architectural side to that and the CAD and some things that I've seen with Zaha Hadid and Calatrava seem to kind of, I see those influences perhaps. So you mentioned, you know, he, he leaves Princeton, he goes to New York, um, he's, he's obviously having uh, conversations, relationships with other artists at the time. He, he's seeing Jasper Johns's Target and mm -hmm. new works by maybe uh, Kelly Rauschenberg. Mm -hmm. How are these uh, elements influencing his ideas at the time? Well, I think they were all looking for a new way to paint after abstract expressionism. And after abstract expressionism, the, the true rage was gestural painting. And gestural painting was a, was a form of using your hand and your shoulder to make these very expressive paintings. I mean, Hans Namu's photographs of Jackson Pollock slinging paint on the floor of the studio is the classic idea of expressionist American painting in the, in the mid-50s, late 40s. Um, but, you know, that's kind of an accidental way of painting. It works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work. And they were all looking for a more logical way to compose abstract paintings. John's uh, solution of using the American flag, which has stripes that run across the surface of the canvas and coinciding the image of the flag with the shape of the canvas, solved that issue of relational painting. Now it was a matter of logic, simply use stripes and it was a matter of how you painted the stripes that distinguished you and what colors you used. And from there, he, he came into his, he started reducing the, the color palette and he ended up with his famous black paintings in which he takes a black line, wide enamel paint, black enamel paint, and runs it the circumference of the picture. He literally uses the shape of the canvas as the way of organizing the gesture, which at the time seemed really, really radical. If you compare it to Pollock's drip paintings, it was almost a slap in the face that might appear to abstract expressionism. But, you know, with hindsight, I think you look at the black paintings now, and they're, they're as much uh, Mark Rothko as they are Jasper Johns. They're very moody. Um, you know, they, what they do do that abstract expressionism was starting to do but hadn't got there yet was to use industrial materials. The enamel paint was 99 cents a gallon. It was the cheapest paint Frank could find, but it was also paint uh, Frank was familiar with because to make money he painted houses, which de Kooning also painted houses before he was famous and he, uses, he used a wide brush. The enamel paint has a kind of a sheen to it, uh, so it has a harder surface. So what Frank is introducing at this point, 1959, is what we would call a kind of industrial abstraction, which would eventually become minimalism, which is a very important movement in the 1960s. And we'll, we'll go on to minimalism in just a second. I'm just curious, when you mentioned the stripe paintings, in relationship to John's flag paintings. When I spoke to him, he mentioned that he was more attracted to the target and that everybody talks about the flag paintings. Do you think that he's remembering his interests uh, uh, differently as he, as he changes? Or do you think that there is that, uh, the target is easily read into those stripe paintings? I think that, I think that there are two issues here with the John's. One is the stripes which Frank clearly recognized as being 
a unique way of organizing a picture. The target paintings, what really distinguished some of the target paintings were their colors. And there's a very famous target painting which is bright, bright green. And I think he was influenced by John's use of this very bright, intense green. Not that Frank ever used that green, but Frank eventually became one of the more important experimenters with color in terms of abstraction. So I think he got a lot from different aspects of John's as well as from, very, from Barnett Newman, you know, who made a zip uh, painting. I think there were, you know, you're, he's 22 years old. I mean, Frank's idea was the way you learn how to make abstractions is you just copy other people's abstractions until you're so sick of copying them, you eventually end up making one of your own. Can we talk about his move, his transition into minimalism and the effect that had um, on the uh, on other artists and on the art community in general? How was that significant? Well, Frank's black paintings were in a very famous show at the Museum of Modern Art called 16 Americans. And it was a show that MoMA did to uh, take account of the importance of some of the best artists in America at the time. Frank was 22 years old. He was in a show with Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Ellsworth Kelly, Louise Nevelson, Richard Diebenkorn, I mean, older artists. And here was this young guy with these black paintings, these seemingly very monotonous, dull black paintings. So that was a bit of a sensation. And then MoMA bought one of the black paintings. That was amazing, a 22-year-old in the collection of MoMA. After the black paintings, Frank had a succession of shows at Leo Castelli Gallery, 1960, 61, 62. He moved from black enamel paint to a metallic aluminum paint. And he was doing designs that weren't a little more complicated than the shape of a rectangular canvas. And he was putting them on a canvas, and he didn't like how the design didn't exactly fit the shape of the canvas anymore, as it had done with the black paintings. He had his friend, a painter named uh, Darby Bannard, come over and say, what do you think, Darby? And he goes, I like him. Frank said, yeah, but I don't, I don't like how the design doesn't really work with the shape of the canvas. Darby said, well, look, if you like the design, but you don't like the shape of the canvas, why don't you take some of the canvas away? So he began to shape his canvases to fit the designs that he was drawing. He was using another industrial paint now, not black, not house paint, not enamel paint, but this metallic aluminum paint, the kind of paint you use to paint a radiator in a New York loft. So, I mean, it had a very industrial feel, much thicker, much more insistent surface, really made the painting, along with the fact that it was shaped, feel like an object. And Donald Judd at that time did a very famous article, which I don't think anyone can ever explain to me what the article means, but the title of the article was what was key, I think. And it was titled Specific Objects, which was meant to refer to this new minimalism. And specific objects referred to the fact that, well, we don't have to worry about categories like painting or sculpture. What we're thinking about are very specific American objects. And Frank was a leader through this experimentation with metallic paints. And there is copper paints that he used to use to paint his father's boat, the hull of his boat that protected it from uh, salt water. Um, he used those in his copper paintings. And it's because of those paintings, these really predate Carl uh, Andre and Donald Judd, in their use of industrial materials. But they, it was all one big conversation in the 60s between these three artists. And keep in mind that, that Frank went to Andover with Carl Andre, and uh, Frank lent Carl uh, a section of his studio to make his earliest work. And F Frampton was around at that time. Hollis Frampton was also friends, particularly with Frank, Carl, and Hollis Frampton. Hollis did these famous series of photographs of Frank called The Secret World of Frank Stella, 
which are a kind of a send up of, you know, famous behind the scenes photographs of Picasso or Matisse. But in Frank's case, he's wearing sunglasses and a trench coat, uh, like he's a, a super agent. And I mean, they're really quite funny. And, and in a way, they're very revealing. It's so, someday someone will do a, a long piece on how those photographs reflect the kind of work Frank eventually ended up doing. Well, let's talk about his uh, use of color. I mean, you've mentioned it a few times. Uh, Obviously, in his later works, they become more brighter, brash, neon. Um, but at the beginning, he's still working with muted colors that he's maybe, mm -hmm. I think they're the colors that he can just find. Is that correct? And he's yeah. not specifying what he needs at that point in terms of color, but he's obviously mm -hmm. able to play with it. How does that development of color progress? Well, he was it, with the copper, uh, aluminum and the black enamel paint, he would literally go to the hardware store and say, what can't you sell? And the guy would go, on that table right over there. And Frank would say, well, how much do you want for him? He'd say, well, what will you give me? And Frank would give him as little as he could possibly give him. So the paint was cheap, it was industrial paint, but, you know, he makes it sound like it was almost Duchampian, you know, a found object, but in this case, found paint. Um, but it was much more. It was quite deliberate. And the next series after the aluminum copper paintings were the Benjamin Moore series. And in this exhibition, I have six Benjamin Moore paintings. They're about this big. They're really significant in my mind because, well, for two reasons. Here he's using a house paint. Benjamin Moore house paint was the house paint for the suburban household of the 1960s. It was meant to hold up well, to apply, be applied easily, uh, not to drip too much. It was, quite frankly, it was, you know, in terms of pop art that would develop after that, Benjamin Moore paint, which had the good housekeeping seal of approval, is equivalent to eating Campbell's soup. And Andy Warhol was painting Campbell's soup cans. So this was kind of a pop abstraction, versus pop imagery. The Benjamin Moore paintings that I have in this show, 1962, were purchased by Andy Warhol. He bought each That's one for $50. So all six, he got all six for $300. So they're clearly speaking to each other. They're clearly, there's clearly a dialogue going on and Warhol sees what Frank's doing. And Warhol, in, in, in a couple of his books, acknowledged Frank very early on for um, his use of series to make it to take an image and then develop in a series either through variations in color or variations in size or variations in the form. So Frank was very influential on, on pop art and of course was also considered one of the main people of the uh, uh, op art movement which is the optical, about opticality and what color does, because Frank was m using colors that were very aggressive. He was one of the first to use fluorescent and day glow paints. I mean, that seems so long ago, but um, he, was, he was there. Let's continue with your, your mention of series, and you were saying earlier on, you know, how many different periods he's had, how many different projects, and then there's at least, is it 20 or 40 mm -hmm. in each? Uh, what do series mean to him? Well, I think all of the minimalists, and Frank was early in doing this, um, approached art as a systemic procedure. And so they would pose themselves a problem and then work their way through it. Um, but what Frank would do often is work his way through a project until it didn't work for him anymore and he would end up somehow destroying the series and th then develop a new problem out of that. Um, in abstraction, you know, it, 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 I think a systemic way of working is a different way of working or a different word than the term style. I mean, sometimes artists find a style and they stick to a style which I think has very negative connotations to most hardworking artists, to be stylistic, you know, but to be systemic, to be systematic, is to almost approach art from a very American 
pragmatic, John Dewey, almost scientific point of view. It's, a, it, it, it's what distinguished, I think, American art, certainly in the 60s, from European art. It wasn't symbolic, you know. Um, it was simply a system that you worked with to create a visual thing. In his early work, he's avoiding illusion. He's working with the surface and getting rid of gesture and the right. brush. But then right. he moves into what we call maximalism. Uh, can you tell us uh, about how that transference occurs and people's responses to that? Because he's the father of minimalism, supposedly, along with Newman, and suddenly he's doing right. something very different. Well, Frank, along with any of the number of other minimalists, Judd, Dan Flavin, they really didn't like the term minimalism. They saw it as a very negative term. And I actually think it was Flavin who came up with the term maximalism. And so they all began to sort of uh, go against the idea of reduction early on. And Frank did it as early as the early 60s when he started creating illusions in his work. Uh, when he started mixing a lot of different colors together so that it wasn't really minimalist at all. It was really quite active. It was a very active art image. You know, in this exhibition, there is an early minimalist painting next to a very, very late sort of surrealist looking thing. And when I brought Frank in to look at it and showed him that I put them next to each other, he goes, it was amazing, Michael, that when I made that painting in 1958, I had no idea what kind of a painter I would be. And there's no way I could ever guess that I would make that painting. So, I mean, it's really, a, over a 60-year career, it, the system simply morphs into something else. It just becomes more dense and maybe you could say more lyrical, certainly more aggressive materialistically. That's the other thing that Frank's work has always been about, making painting very material and giving painting a presence in space that it had never had. Let's talk about that idea of space and pushing out or moving into the space, whether it's through the shaping of the canvas or through his later works, where literally the works are on scaffolding, standing out. How do you see that work activating space and the architectural influences in that work? Well, you know, in those works, they literally have um, their bars, but I consider them sort of legs, feet, and arms. So in those cases, it'll have one foot on the ground, and then one of the bars will reach up and touch the wall, and then the body of the piece is leaning out from the wall. So it really operates in an area somewhere between painting, relief, and full-on three-dimensional sculpture. I think that you have to keep in mind that Frank was the very first generation that began as an abstract painter. In other words, he didn't do portrait drawings and little landscape drawings, and gradually they morph into abstraction. When he started making art, the only way to make art in his mind was abstraction, which is a very reductive form. And over 60 years, I think Frank has said to himself, how can we keep abstraction alive? I mean, at what point does non-imagistic abstract work simply become decorative? And there are a number of ways to do it, through aggressive color, through, through materiality, and of course the other way is through making it more aggressive in space. And there have been people who say, well, Frank, you've taken it to the point where you actually don't make paintings anymore. These are sculptures. Well, Frank's argument is, and I agree with him, when you look at a sculpture, um, you look at it pictorial. Because you, don't, you can't see, your brain can't walk around a sculpture. You have to walk you know, in steps. And as you do, you frame it, boom, 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 boom. That's a pictorial way of looking at sculpture. There's also, you know, a sculptural way of looking at painting, which is what he does. So, you know, there's a huge piece in this show of, of uh, poured uh, aluminum and metal that has been, it's a conglomeration that goes up like 20 feet and comes out 25 feet, but it's on an iron easel, as if to say, it's, this is still a painting because it's on an easel. 
not just a wall, it's on an easel, an old-fashioned easel. It happens to be made of core 10 steel, but... I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, the idea of uh, decorative and like mm -hmm. pulling away from that, perhaps, but um, there's been a lot written about him and um, the Baroque period, mm -hmm. but when I spoke to him, he didn't see that reading at all in his work, and he didn't understand why critics were discussing his work as being influenced or in dialogue with Baroque. I wondered if you could mention why there is that reading of it and um, his, his, uh, how his work might sit uh, next to uh, a pushing, a challenging of ornament and the Baroque uh, painters. Well, I, I think, you know, Frank, you saw him talk with me on the Tuesday night, you know, he'll argue with you. You bring up a good point, he will argue right against it. And uh, you are right on about the Baroque. I mean, the Scarlatti series in this show, he was a Baroque composer. Um, well, I was going to mention that, you know, the uh, naming of these works. I mean, he's obviously referencing Baroque harpsichordists by titling the work that way. So I was a little bit baffled, but I wanted to uh, politely recognize his opinion, but I wondered if it's changed. He did those, his famous lectures in 1983 at Harvard University, the Norton Lectures. An abstract painter had never been asked to do this. This was a huge honor and a big deal for the art world. He did a series of talks which influenced all of us called Working Space. The core of Working Space is a discussion of Caravaggio, a Baroque painter. Well, that's what I was thinking. And, and, and Caravaggio, how he differed from the Renaissance, how he reinvigorated painting was to make the illusion come out toward the viewer as opposed into the window of the painting. And of course, Frank's work physically comes out to the viewer. I mean, it's a Caravaggio-esque way of approaching abstraction. So there's no question that he has been influenced by the broke. Maybe he just forgot that day. <laughs> well, we're out for that moment then. Um, I guess uh, my last question would be, what, what are the most recent works in the exhibition? And how do they inform us of where he is now or how his work has progressed? The newest work in the exhibition is, um, was made uh, partially with a CAD program, and it's made of a material called protogen, and protogen is what is used in three-dimensional printing. So he creates an image, and then he puts it into a CAD program, he twists it around, distorts it, tries to find the most interesting angles he can, and then he sends it to an engineer who 3D prints it. So the most recent work in the exhibition was not made by Frank's hand. Uh, the image was made by his hand, but the actual thing was not made by Frank's hand. It was made by a, a machine that printed it from the ground up, you know, 3D printing. And is that what he's doing now? Is he dedicated to that kind of work, or is that just where he was at that point and he'll, he'll transform it into something else at some point? He probably will transform it to something else. He always, I mean, he's constantly changing. That's what makes Frank Stella, Frank Stella. I mean, Frank Stella is always fighting against himself. You know, he sets up these systems, he sets up these way of workings, and then exhausts them, picks up the pieces, and makes up a new thing. We want to thank Michael for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar.